It's a good question. It's a good question. I mean, I think there's a lot of doctors who are waking up to this for sure. Um, those doctors tend to be the doctors that are sort of like more, I don't know, for the most part, more plant focused. It's almost like there's, there's two different populations of doctors. There's, there's two different, um, when doctors decide to educate themselves outside of their traditional medical practice, they go into one of two worlds. They either go into the plant-based world or they go into the functional medicine world. Okay. And so what I've observed is that the people who go into the functional medicine world end up going down the paleo keto carnivore route. And then they are educated by those experts. And then they say, oh, okay, meat is good for you. Plants are bad for you. Plants contain anti-nutrients. Don't eat plants, right? That's the one direction. And then the other direction is like, wait a minute, hold on a second. Uh, plants are actually very good for you. Try and reduce your intake of meat and dairy products altogether. And that's going to make you healthier, right? So I think doctors as a whole are waking up to the fact that pharmaceutical uh, medications are not the answer, but um, unfortunately, what I see is that the majority of doctors go down the functional medicine route. It's like, you know, I don't really know the numbers, but let's just say it's like seven out of 10 go down the functional medicine route and three out of 10 go down the plant-based route. And, um, the ones that go down the plant-based route are the ones that vibe with this description. And the one that go down the functional medicine route vibe with a completely different description. Now, what's the difference between functional medicine and integrative medicine? Uh, I, I've been asking myself the question that for a long time. And I ask a lot of doctors and a lot of doctors are like, I don't know. I don't know. Functional medicine has a very vague uh, definition associated with it. And I have a difficult time really understanding what that means myself, but it's somewhere along the lines of like, we're going to use food as medicine and we're going to use other modalities outside of pharmaceutical medication to see if we can find a way to heal you, right? It could be breath work. It could be intermittent fasting. It could be exercise. And these are all things that even the plant-based world believes in. But the term functional medicine has just been, uh, you know, it's almost like the, it's like a rebranded term to describe a different type of doctor. And my observation is that people who are on that route tend to fall into the, you know, keto carnivore route, thinking that that's the, that's the right way to go. And they have an alternate explanation of what causes insulin resistance. All right. Another definition question. What is the difference between autophagy and apoptosis? Yeah, good question. Okay. So uh, autophagy is basically a cellular recycling program. So let's just, let's, let's just make sure we're on the same page. Okay. What I talked about earlier is apoptosis. It's spelled A-P-O-P-tosis. So you read it and you say, it looks like it says apoptosis, but it's actually apoptosis. And apoptosis is basically programmed cell death. So it's cell death that occurs as a result of a dysfunctional metabolic state. Okay, so if there is a cell that is in a problematic state, the cell could be, um, you know, in an inflamed state, it could be secreting cytokines, it could be uh, inside of a, a metastatic tumor, um, it could be uh, a beta cell that's under attack from the pancreas, it could be any number of mechanisms. Those cells end up um, going through a programmed cell death where they basically kill themselves. Okay, um, autophagy is slightly different. Autophagy is a cellular recycling program where the cells that are in a dysfunctional state are intentionally cleared and, and put into the trash can so that they can give rise to healthier cells in the vicinity, okay? So do cells that, uh, are the cells that are cleared by the autophagy state actually apoptotic? I don't know if I know the answer to that question, but, um, you can think of it as, it, let's put it this way, even if the cells that were cleared in the autophagy process did undergo apoptosis, the, the apoptosis that I was referring to is the apoptosis of a healthy cell that shouldn't be killing itself. Okay, so I, I refer to apoptosis as basically being like, a, like a, a, a distress signal, but autophagy is actually the clearance of cells that are either like in a dysfunctional state that leads to the betterment or the improvement of the organism as a whole. Okay, so based on the way that you described it, apoptosis should be looked at as kind of the, when things aren't going properly in your body and right. autophagy when they are. So for example, if you're going through a fast, you may go through autophagy and clear right. these, these cells that need to be cleared out. And that's a healthy mechanism. And apoptosis in, the, in, in this context that you were talking about is when there's a, a disease state basically and something... Uh, these cells are basically dying unnecessarily. They should have been healthy cells and live, but because there's a problem, they're 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 dying. That's exa that's exactly right. That's exactly right. You said it well. All right. 
Thank you. And with keto diet and people becoming um, severely insulin resistant because they're reinforcing that mechanism with their diet in probably the most severe way, right? By eating such high fat. Um, how do how does somebody who's been on a keto diet for so long and built up such um, such uh, insulin resistance come off of that diet safely without spiking the sugar up the wazoo? Or is that even yeah. amazing? Yep, that's the, the here's the answer. The answer is right here. The answer is slowly, because uh, if you make the change too quickly. Uh, then what'll happen is that your glucose will go high and then you'll give up after a week or two weeks being like, oh my, this isn't working. So rather than doing that, the approach is to make the change slowly. Like I said, if you're going to change your diet, I recommend changing your diet over the course of like one to two months and start by subtracting, subtracting fat rich foods first, and then increasing carbohydrate intake later. And if you do it that way, then you can at least slow down or reduce the amount of insulin resistance that's present inside of your liver and muscle to begin with, which then increases your carbohydrate tolerance, enabling you to eat more carbohydrate over the course of time. And, but with naming specific foods, what, what foods would someone eat in that middle state where you're getting rid of the high fat foods and you're not going for the high carbohydrate foods? Great question. Okay. So here's what I would say. We're going to be trying to subtract these foods over here on the right hand side, like we talked about the, the the red foods, and you know you can eat some yellow foods, but try and minimize those. The what we're trying to figure out here is like, what am I going to eat at first in the green light category, and then how am I going to change that over the course of time? So what I would recommend doing is moving towards non-starchy vegetables. Those are things like cauliflower and tomatoes and cucumbers and broccoli and Brussels sprouts, okay? These are all vegetables that don't contain a significant amount of starch. Eat a significant amount of those. Eat a lot of beans, lentils, and peas because these are basically legumes that have carbohydrate, but it is a very slow releasing form of carbohydrate and maximize your green leafy vegetable intake. So if you could just sort of focus on these three right in the middle, then what that'll enable you to do is uh, eat a slow acting form of carbohydrate and a lot of other, you know, non-starchy and green leafy vegetable material. And then after you do that for the, you know, at least a seven day period, maybe even seven to 14 days, then you start to increase your intake of starchy vegetables and fruits in particular. And then when you do that, you will start to find that your ability to metabolize those starchy vegetables and fruits goes up significantly because you've already subtracted out a significant amount of fat from the right-hand side. So we had Gabriel Cousins on earlier today. I don't know if you are familiar with, with his um, work. Yep. Okay. And he's not a big fan of fruit. And he, he actually did a talk on, on diabetes today. And he compared his protocol with uh, Dr. Neil Bernard's. And he's a big fan of Dr. Neil Bernard's. What? He showed the numbers, uh, you know, like the blood sugar levels of somebody on his diet versus the diet that... Uh, Dr. Neil uh, Bernard uh, um, recommends, um, and according to him, he you know it's the numbers are are quite stark with with regard to how far down he's been able to get the blood sugar, uh, and he said that fruit, is, you know, and and having a low amount of fruit is uh, is something that he highly recommends, and is is a major reason why the, he saw that he sees the numbers that he sees with regard to blood sugar. What what are your thoughts on that? Like, are and basically, and and the numbers for for Dr. Neil Bernard's were were good and in the healthy range. It just he just saw uh, you know a more drastic and and I guess perhaps healthier or maybe it's just you're getting these really great numbers, but maybe it doesn't confer any any real life benefit. I that I don't know. Right. What are your thoughts on uh, Dr. Cousins' protocol and his, his purported outcomes? Is uh, specifically when he was comparing. Dr. Barnard's research versus his, was this on people with prediabetes in type two or in type one? I can, I can pull up the slide in, in a, uh, in a minute. If you give me a minute to scroll sure. back. Um, I'm assuming it was in prediabetes in type two, because the majority of Barnard's research has actually been there. Yeah. Well, I, I know, I know that it was type two. It definitely. It definitely wasn't type one. Okay. Um, cool, cool. Cool. Okay. Perfect. Yeah. So, um, so you're right again. So 
Gabriel Cousins, mad respect for him. Fantastic individual, great guy. Um, and, and he's right. Like if you play the carbohydrate avoidance game, which is basically a high fat intake, he's just doing a high fat intake from a completely plant-based approach. Hmm. If you play that game, you're going to get better blood glucose values. You will, you will get a flat line blood glucose response. And the question really becomes is a flat line blood glucose response better than a slightly, uh, you know, like, uh, what's sort of like a eight? Is a flatline blood glucose response better than having some variation in your blood glucose on a daily basis in terms of long-term health outcomes, right? Because you could look at it on a piece of paper and say, okay, flat is better, but then if it doesn't necessarily translate to any improvement in metabolic health down the road, then what's the point, okay? So that's, that's what I would say, number one. Um, secondarily, I think um, I always go back to the research. Um, there's research demonstrating what happens to people who are eating a, who are non-diabetic individuals. Um, and you take a look at their blood glucose variance on a daily basis. And what you will see is that non-diabetic individuals have a blood glucose variance from about 70 milligrams per deciliter, all the way up to 153 per day. So there's, there's a fluctuation that kind of goes up and down and up and down. And that is considered totally normally fit, normal, normal physiology. And so if that's what people who are non-diabetic at a very low risk for disease are doing, and that's considered normal mammalian physiology, then why would we try and invent a system that gets you flatter than that um, and, and um, thinking that it's going to have a, long, a better long-term health outcome, okay? I would love to see, if we could fast forward 20 years into the future, I would love to see head-to-head -head if like the mastering diabetes approach and Dr. Gabriel Cousins approach ended up with two distinctly different health outcomes or Dr. Barnard versus Dr. Cousins. I'd love to see if there's two distinctly health, different health outcomes. We just don't have that information at this point. And I don't think there's enough time to determine whether or not that's true, but I don't think that there's enough scientific evidence to conclude that having a completely flat blood glucose is gonna lead to better health outcomes. And is there a possibility that you run into the risk of what you see with the keto diet where your blood sugar looks great, but you're, you may actually be making yourself more, um, insulin resistant? Yeah, exactly right. Because what Gabriel Cousins is doing again, is he's teaching people how to eat a high fat, uh, raw high fat diet, basic and um, plant based. And what that means is that people are eating themselves into insulin resistance. They are just doing it using plant based food. So they're eating a much more nutrient dense collection of foods, but they are still in an insulin resistant state as far as their liver and muscle are concerned. Can you see the screen? This is this is the slide that I was referring to. Just real quickly, yeah. you can answer. There's anything in new on here? Um, okay, so we've got ADA versus Dr. Cousins versus Barnard. So he basically says weight loss nine, eighteen, twelve, medication twenty six, ninety seven, forty six. Okay.